Well, good morning, Voyagers! I hope everyone's having a fantastic Thursday. I know I am. I'm wonderful to see everyone here. Wonderful to see some of our guests here. We're still waiting on a few more to join, but, you know, let's go ahead and get some introductions out the way. Let's go ahead and get the topic out the way. Today's topic is going to be, has Web3 governance peaked? You know, have we seen everything that could be done to it, or is there still so much more to come? But let's go ahead and start off with our, our guests today. We got two of them up here right now while we wait for the rest. Uh, Jen Layer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a brief description. Let us know about you. Hey, Cody. Thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Edgars. I'm the co-founder and chief product officer of uh, Jaeger AI, which is an AI lab building the protocol called Gen Layer. Uh, we just announced our seven and a half million seed round uh, to build Gen Layer, which is the world's first intelligent blockchain. We call it that. What do I mean by that? It's um, it's a blockchain where the smart contracts, instead of being isolated from the outside world, relying on oracles uh, directly from the smart contract, you can connect to any public website, fetch in any public data, and you can execute natural language instructions. So it uses large language models uh in as part of the smart contract and also as part of the consensus process uh so for example you can have a prediction market uh that without any human intervention it says hey go to bbc.com and use the large language model to find out who's the president of the united states resolve this prediction market or you know things like parametric insurance go to weather.com and find out if there's a flood in uh, lisbon or something like that the way it works under the hood real quick is um you might have questions, you know, how, how can this be reliable? You've used ChatGPT, you know, it hallucinates time to time. Uh, the way we do it uh, is we have many validators with many different large language models, um, and they work together uh, to check each other's work and come to an agreement. The quickest way to explain, if you know, you know, I imagine in this governance uh, podcast, people might know, imagine Kleros, but instead of people in the jury, you have large language models. Uh, and through this approach, our network can use the latest models, closed source, open source. We don't do proof of inference. And they, by checking each other's work, they can achieve very high levels of reliability, at least for certain types of tasks. And then, you know, as the models get smarter, uh, the network can get smarter and more reliable as well. Uh, yeah, so that's really quickly about Gen Layer. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this uh, conversation. Really glad to have you up here as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to butcher this, but Creon, uh, how you doing? Tell us a little oh, about yeah. yourself and tell me how bad my English is. No, that was it. It's Creon. Thank you for saying that right. <laughs> but, and uh, yeah, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Creon. I'm actually just a co-founder of a Blades for Earn Gaming um, Guild um, here in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm based in Manila, Philippines. And I'm so stoked about this conversation. This really got my... It really got my interest when I was checking it out on Xcohost. And uh, I'm so happy to meet you and um, also Jen Layer. So I'm excited for this conversation. What's up, everybody? Uh, please share this, share the tweet or retweet the space. And uh, if you can let, if you can tag your friends, you know, this might be a conversation they want to, to get involved in. Appreciate you guys. Very much so. Make sure you tell your friends, everyone. All right. And, you know, if you're not, make sure you follow all these guests that came up here to speak. All these people do something in the space. They wake up every day. They think Web3. They eat Web3. So make sure to follow all the speakers. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our CEO of Void and our founder, Chris Switter. Chris, how are you doing today? Tell us everyone a little about yourself that doesn't know. Oh, I'm just living the dream. Good morning, everybody. Um, so like uh, Cody said, my name is Chris. I'm one of the co-founders of Voy. Um what don't people know? So, I mean, I'll just talk about like uh, what I'm working up and doing every day with Voy is that uh, we believe that the current economics of the majority of blockchains right now are broken, um, mainly specifically around uh, distribution. Um, most of the, the large majority of tokens are held by the early investors, early stakeholders. And uh, because of that, um, those early holders are actually no longer adding value to the chain, but yet the people that are adding value to chain, the, the ecosystem, the people that are here every day, the, you guys are a, a small minority of the actual holders. The problem with that is that it, it breaks down and it, it breaks down the actual economic system and makes you all mercenaries because you have to suck value from the chain because you don't actually own the chain. 
And so what Voy has done, Voy has created because we wanted to fix this problem. We wanted to make sure that the economics, um, the incentives aligned with the true value of blockchain and make sure that the, the ecosystem, the people that are adding value every day are actually the owners of the chain. And so um, that's what we've been working on, uh, been pretty successful, have a pretty great uh, community so far. We are actually hitting main nets. Uh, our, the genesis is in next week, which is pretty nuts. Uh, been a long journey. And um, yeah, so that's what everything so far. Very well said, Chris. This is why you're my boss and I'm just the guy that hosts spaces. Well said. Uh, I would I'd like to introduce uh, Taraxa. Um, they joined us last week and we had some really great discussions and i um, happy to have you here again. How are you doing today, Tarek? So tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what your project is. It's really great to be here again and thank you for having me on the spaces. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Poo. I'm one of the co-founders of the Tarasa project. So we are a layer one. We're the only proof of stake block DAG EVM compatible layer one in the world. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we're also building in addition to layer one is a social AI network called Echo, um, which actually does a lot of you know, does a lot of things with uh, data that's just generated on Telegram. Um, we're plugged into over 20,000 um, different Telegram groups, have over a million messages in just a daily. And um, yeah, and then uh, we do things like automated social campaigns, filtering out bots and spammers. Um, we do things like automated trading uh, based on social signals um, generated uh, uh, generated in the uh, in the data. And then we also do, um, you know, automated do your own research, right? People can ask about any project narrative asset um, and what people are talking about them right now. Um, so all of this is, of course, AI driven. And uh, we're, I think we're really excited to bring this data set and a lot of these microservices that we've built on top of this uh, decentralized network uh, to help supercharge a lot of the applications that we see are building up, uh, uh, that, that are building right now. So hopefully we can uh, work with some of you guys. Uh, very interested in, in what in what uh, Boy is doing. I think uh, you know building a healthy community based on contribution has been a big pain point. It's, it's something that we also are looking at very very uh, very very carefully. So hopefully we can talk about that. Also, what Gen Layer is doing is also extremely interesting. I would love to know how you guys made your uh, um, LMs deterministic, so you can actually do comparisons on chain. Yeah, love 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 to find out more. Thanks. Thank you, Teraxa. Um, let's go ahead and introduce some of our other guests. Uh, Nick, how are you doing today? Welcome up to the space and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Thanks so much for having me. This is, um, sounds like we got a, a nice solid crew of A-listers up here. So uh, pleasure to be here and really looking forward to this conversation. My name is Nick Odio. Uh, I'm the chief growth officer at Ferrum Labs. Uh, Ferrum Labs is the core contributor to Ferrum Network. Uh, we've been around for quite a while. Um, some of you might recognize the name. We've been around in the space for about six years now um, and have really um, kind of gotten to where we are through a pretty grassroots community-oriented um, ethos. Uh, and now we're, we're finally at this point where we're ready for the next phase of growth and we're starting the raise for Ferrum Labs to really push things to the next level. Uh, at its core, Ferrum Labs is, um, or Ferrum Network, I should say, is an interoperability protocol, um, which is, you know, really why this uh, this title of, of the space is the space has got me super intrigued was because I, I don't think Web3 has peaked because I don't think we've solved one of the biggest cruxes in the space yet, which is interoperability. So we'll dive into a lot of that. I'm sure during this conversation, but um, yeah, just like, uh, you know, the internet was a pretty segregated and fragmented solution back, uh, back in the nineties um, and up until TCP IP came out. Uh, that's kind of the same thing we're facing in web three right now. Uh, so we're uh, pioneering something we're calling TCP BP <laughs> uh, uh, instead of internet protocol, blockchain protocol at the end there. Um, and uh uh, really trying to create standards for uh, blockchain, blockchain interoperability standards across the space. Uh, there's a lot of really great solutions out there focusing on interoperability, but we're kind of continuing to kick the can further down the road with different um, 
you know, uh, multi-chain token standards and things like that, that really have just kind of um, continued fragmenting the space in, uh, beyond just wrap tokens and things. Now we've got different versions of, it, of multi-chain token standards and uh, multi-chain smart contracts and things like that. So there needs to be some sort of consensus. So we're really pushing that uh, that forward in that frontier. Uh, and we think that's really going to be when Web3 can peak is when we solve that problem um, and create a more cohesive Web3. So excited to dive deeper mo in, into all that. And um, But yeah, Nick Odio, Chief Growth Officer from Ferrum, Net, from Ferrum Labs. And uh, thanks uh, everyone for, for being here and let's let's dive in. I'm stoked. Thank you so much for that, Nick. And our last but not least, Rami, how are you doing today? Tell us a little bit about yourself and then we will get started. Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Rami. I'm the marketer lead of XP Network. XP Network is an NFT multi-chain bridge. We currently support 33 blockchains, EVM and non-EVM. And thank you so much for having us. Thank you for joining, sir. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Started with my first little topic here, and that's going to be, what? Why has we not seen any new developments in the way governance is done? Has it peaked, or do we just need to figure out how to make technology better before we can make governance better? What do you guys think is the hindrance of right now, or do you think there is, there is no hindrance? And I'm, you know, some people are just blind. Um, Taraxa, where would you like to go? Yeah, so as a as a layer one, governance is something we actually do spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, there's just, there, I think there's a confluence of a lot of different factors here. Um, I think the, the very first one is that I think a lot of projects out there don't care about governance, right? They're, most projects in crypto are set up as scams. So who cares, right? Um, people come out of a project, pump and dump, and they leave. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the dominant factor here. Um, I think re uh, a hostile regulatory environment is also another factor. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to comment too much about that, but the regulatory environment, at least in the U.S., has made it extremely difficult for uh, for founding teams to effectively communicate <clears throat> and organize um, an effective governance structure. Um, it just made it extraordinarily difficult. Um, uh, in the U.S., if you're not in the U.S., just FYI, the U.S. regulatory agencies want to kill all crypto. Period. There's there's no there's no uh, there's no sort of a, a ambiguity there. Um, I think the third thing is actually um, uh, kind of interesting. It's just the nature of democracy, right? Um, governance it requires people to actually do something, right? Um, uh, it, you know, it's uh, um, I think we we just heard from Chris, right, talking about a bunch of people. You know, trying to buy into a project, but you know, obviously just sitting there doing absolutely nothing, uh, while the people that are actually doing something have no stake, right? Um, so that's always the case. Um, you know, if you look at any sort of election, how many people turn up, right? People complain about things, but do they actually turn up to do something? Uh, who in your community actually wants to participate in governance, right? When you run a governance campaign, how what percentage of the uh, the voting power actually shows up to vote on anything. Are they well informed? Uh, are they qualified to, you know, to actually make an informed decision? Do they actually think about these things? Um, so that's just the nature of democracy. It's just it's hard for people to uh, to participate, right? People are uh, apathetic. They're just here to make some money and get, you know, get the fuck out. And um, so I think a lot of different factors make governance um, tricky in general and specifically kind of very hazardous in Web3. So um, it's an interesting topic, but uh, <laughs> very, very hard, yeah. I very much agree with you there. Uh, a lot of complicated lines to make it as, as you say, quote unquote, decentralized as possible, but you know, it takes a lot of effort on the other side to make it you know, as decentralized as possible as well. And, you know, not everyone's interested in the whole, you know, no one really cares about, you know, how the cake is made. They just want to eat the cake. Uh, Jim Layer, what do you got? And then we'll move over to Chris and then Creon. Then... Yeah, I want to pick up uh, on the last point, basically, of, of the lack of involvement. Uh, I think that's probably one of the deeper issues in governance. And, you know, we're friends with, for example, the Q protocol. Um, they're focused on kind of intersubjective um, 
consensus as well with people and some of the feedback i got from some of their team as well that, that you know people get fatigued from <laughs> making a lot of decisions you know and i mean let's be fair we're all very busy you know there's a lot of stuff going on in, in my personal life and in, in my work life you know uh, for anybody to kind of drop into any governance of a protocol and kind of you know really have to pay attention and read a lot of proposals and all of that it takes a lot of time so i think to be fair to people it is a lot of work so i understand why maybe not everybody wants to uh, do that all the time where it's kind of hard to get people excited um i think potentially the interesting thing is that uh, there are solutions there are technologies appearing that might help solve this uh, from my point of view i think those are large language models basically because they're really starting to bring kind of capability of reasoning um, to computers. I mean, arguably, you know, people disagree what exactly they're doing, but for sure they understand kind of language and they can start to make some real complex decisions, you know, way, be way beyond what you could write into code. So, for example, something that we're looking at in GenLayer, uh, we just had a hackathon internally, uh, we made a small project about this, is that, you know, with this natural language capability in the smart contract, you can now, let's say, put the whole constitution of a DAO inside the smart contract itself. So now when a pro proposal comes in, the network itself can evaluate, hey, is this proposal even in line with our constitution or do we need to reject it? Or you know, if you wanna get even more advanced, then maybe the DAO can automatically, again, using LLMs, uh, start making bounty proposals or evaluating kind of grant submissions or you know, making, making, making governance a lot more automated, you know, enforce the actual, the constitution that everybody wants to agree, you know, make, make that part automatic and kind of minimize the involvement you know, let, let the people be involved on, on the things that really matter and kind of automate a lot of that. So I'm really excited about how AI can basically help governance uh, improve. Yeah, really interesting to see what, what AI can do to help, you know, blockchain move. It, it hasn't been integrated well yet. So, I, you know, there, there could be a lot that can go on there. Chris, what do you got to add? The, um, I believe it was... Uh, Tracks, um that actually talk, talk about it, maybe with somebody else, but um, the the truth is, is that people are lazy. People don't really want to actually um, read these proposals. They don't want to actually do a lot of these things. They, they can even care. I mean, honestly, I, I know a lot of people that um, will do actually care what goes through, but, you know, put down a four, four uh, page five page, 10 page proposal, they're like, yeah, right, maybe I don't care that much. Um, or I do care that much, but it's like, I don't really wanna do that. Um, so you have really have to deal with the actual people being lazy. And this is not just a crypto thing. People are lazy just everywhere. And so the question is that, well, if people are all, always lazy and they have always been lazy, um, how do we have governments got now? And I think a lot of uh, crypto governments, what I've seen is they've kind of throw, thrown the baby out with the bathwater. They go, okay, what if we um, just use pure on-chain tech to be able to do it? And I know maybe that is actually the end, the end result, but there's been actually a lot of work, a lot of study, a lot of research in the last hundreds of thousands of years of how to actually build a government. And using that mixed with the actual, the benefits of how blockchain can make it better through through voting, through actually like real-time delegation, through a lot of things that blockchain can make an, an existing system better, you can actually build a good governance. Uh, this is what we've done with VOI is that uh, we've developed out a, a tripartite system where we have the executive, the legislative, and the, the judicial. Similar to the, uh, you know, the US uh, with sprinkles of the UK, um, but making sure that the legislative is a group of voted in delegates that the they were actually voted in by the actual token holders but their their power is actually delegated to them in real time so that even though they are voted in if they start acting uh crazy or or against your wishes you have the ability to delegate to a different um uh delegate and then you have another checks and balances with a completely different entity, like the executive. So if something does get passed through, the executive has the ability to veto it, which would, which then requires the the amount to get things passed um, much higher. And then you have judicial, that their job is to actually make sure that everybody's following the rules. So like, like I said, like there's a lot that has been done over in the history of humankind that works really well and has been proven to work really well. 
The key here is to actually to use blockchain as much as you can to allow for lazy people. And by the way, when I I'm, I'm lazy too. I think we all we all lazy at one time or another. Um, to be able to participate in governance through delegation and giving the people the ability to actually put in as much effort as they want into the existing system because of blockchain. So I think that we haven't actually seen the peak. Um, I think that's we will learn over time and things will adapt. And I think that's like through AI, um, make things easier, make make actual like checking proposals easier. But at the end of the day, um, blockchain didn't invent governance. Why are we pretending that it did? Well said, sir. Uh, Creon, what, what do you got to add? Then we'll go over to Nick. You know what? This is a very uh, interesting topic, and I don't really want this to sound like an echo chamber, but I honestly agree with it, what everybody said. And uh, I, I believe that it's we have not you know, reached the peak of governance here in Web3 um, because... Uh, simply because you know change is constant, and I don't want to sound <laughs> philosophical or something, but the world is change driven, right? Um, whether we like it or not, um, I see that you know uh, it, it, the the hindrance right now is I think because majority of people who are like building on a blockchain is looking at what they're building as a financial vehicle, um, probably because. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of opportunity to to be taken advantage of. Uh, I don't know, uh, but hopefully, time will come that people are like educated enough to 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 know how to give feedback to these um, projects and their communities, um, so that we can actually do something um, that is right, you know, and, and we can probably formulate uh, a proper governance. Um, I see that you know. Uh, in some DAOs, I don't know um, whether it's a DAO or not, but th yeah, I see a lot of um, problem there. But but I was like um, not really a part of a DAO, but well, sort of. But I see, I, I just based just based on my experience, you know, um, they, ex you know, these projects they experience low participation in govern uh, in governance decision. That's so that's one of those things that are actually like holding back the governance, um, the progress in, in governments um, here in Web3. Um, I think that needs a lot of, um, th there's a lot of, a big room of improvement there uh, when it comes to governance, you know, because um, sometimes token holders may not actively engage in voting um, and that leads to power concentration among um, a small group of, of, yeah, small just small group of uh, partic uh, participants, uh, specifically those who have a lot of tokens. If it, if it if it's about their, uh, you know, if if the decision is based on how much token you hold, right? Um, also, sometimes it's the complexity of decision making. So, so some some members of the DAO or or or, or a certain organization doesn't feel anything about you know. It's like they're just apathetic about it. Um, and then, but but I see that there are different approaches and, and also experimentation when it comes to uh, to handling governance, right? So, so that's uh, I've heard about quadratic voting, uh, you know, to token weighted voting, which I just mentioned, and uh, there's also reputation based systems, huh? But I don't know how how they're not like working I'm, I'm not sure which one is working properly as, as of this point but hearing that there's a there's a a new way which is going to be uh the one that was mentioned earlier which is with the use or the help of ai i think that can help but there might also be problems that will arise eventually um but then um we will still improve just like how the internet the first internet was right in the beginning, right? Um, it improves and, and it keeps improving over time. So yeah, I'm kind of like rambling now. So yeah, let me uh, give the mic back to you, uh, Boy Network. That's no problem, sir. And yeah, I, I agree with you. Like some of these things, like you think they're DAOs, like you kind of said earlier, but you know, you pull off the mask, like, aha, you're just a Discord server, you know. <laughs> but uh, Nick, uh, what do you have to add? And then we'll go back to Taroxa. <laughs> this is a this is a really cool topic. I've I've really been enjoying listening to what everybody's saying. Um, I think 
And, and, and you know, I, I, I love the, the title of this is Did Web3 Peak at Governance? And the first question we're starting off with is, has governance peaked, right? <laughs> it's like not, not even governance has peaked yet. So how is Web3 going to peak if we haven't even figured out really good governance yet? And I think that comes down to, um, like, all things. Like, I, I talked about a little bit ago how um, with Ferrum, we're w working on interoperability standards. Like, the Internet didn't really take off until there was standards across the Internet, right? Um, these TCP, IP, and ICANN came up with all these different standards, and these standards don't exist. And that they don't, they don't exist in, in governance as well, right? So there needs to be more experimentation, which I really enjoyed Chris's, uh, Chris, your, what you guys are doing with VOI and everything. Um, and, and like, you know, taking bits and pieces from different governance models that we've seen throughout history, um, to, to create a, a solid one. I think that's rad. Um, and I think there needs to be more experimentation in that regard before we're able to reach standardization, right? More experimentation leads to standardization. Um, and so, uh, that's something that, you know, like, uh, Creon, you mentioned like, you know, quadratic voting and reputation based voting, there's conviction voting, and there's all these different things. We really haven't evolved too much beyond the token based voting. And so I think there's a lot more that needs to be explored there. And then, you know, like, yeah, are they qualified, right? That's the other thing is like, are these people even qualified to vote? Well, you know, we've got delegation, um, but there's there's other things that can be, uh, you know, explored in, in these different voting methods that can, you know, kind of weed out some of that BS. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing too, and this is like, man, this is, a, a I feel like a broken record because I think every Twitter space I'm on, Somebody mentions this uh, about how Web3 is never going to evolve until we get to the point where there's a really smooth UX UI, right? It's kind of like the like, go-to for everybody. But really, governance, until I'm getting push notifications on my phone saying that there's a proposal that needs reviewing, like we haven't really reached like a point where things are seamless enough for the user to want to be engaged. Um, so that... Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with people being apathetic towards voting, like not caring. It's also just not easy enough for them to care. So we got to make it easy, easy enough for them to care. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's, I don't know. I think I probably made quite a few different points about things that could be improved there, but, um, yeah, there's, but it's, it's rad to see people, you know, really thinking about it. And so I'm, I'm, uh, again, it's, it's an honor to be on this panel with you guys and, and discussing these things. So, um, good on everybody. I appreciate was that, that Nick. Was that Nick? Yeah. Oh yeah. Missing point there. I, yeah. I, I love what you, what you just said. I'm sorry to chime in. Um, no, yeah, go ahead, man. Be, just because, you know, people have like the majority, uh, like the major percentage of like token or something, uh, doesn't mean they, they're qualified to go. And that's actually a problem there. You know, the, people right. just vote out of out of being having the most share in in a company or something, or or, or tokens, right? And that's yeah. kind of sad. Yeah, it is sad. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Taraxa, Ter what do you got to add to that? And then we'll go back. Yeah, to I mean, it's this. Yeah, this is a great discussion. I um, I think I like what Chris said about governance. It's not new, right? I mean, it's it's basically human uh, human. It's a human governance infrastructure, right? So I think it's, um, it only makes sense to learn from the thousands of years of human civilization on how you can actually mirror uh, successful governance models on chain. Um, so, so several points to make here. The first point is we shouldn't take the failures of on-chain governance as failures of on-chain because you see the same failures off-chain, right? So what is the dominant governance model in human history? It's tyranny, right? One guy says, tells everyone else what to do. That's the default. And what's the default for on-chain governance? It's tyranny. One guy holds all the tokens and scams everyone, right? It's That's not a surprise, <laughs> right? That's just how humans behave in general. So, um, uh, so uh, we, you know, and also, you know, we talked about direct democracy, right? What's the default model for direct democracy? Nobody shows up and does anything. That's why you have representative democracy, right? That's why... The, the U.S. wasn't set up as a direct democracy, set up as a republic. We vote representatives to make decisions for us. Now, it's debatable how qualified these representatives are, but it's still a far better model um, as opposed to asking every single citizen to vote on every single thing every single time, right? So we should take, uh, learn from our own, you know, human history and uh, mirror those models. I think where 
on chain can really shine is that it brings around all these technical advantages and tool sets that didn't exist off chain, right? So things like transparency, immutability, and anonymity, right? These are all very interesting properties that exist on chain that allows us to, at a minimum, replicate successful off chain models like, you know, like a representative democracy, um, but adding in these layers of on chain properties. Uh, when you start integrating things like external oracles, um, you know, integrating stuff like a reputation layer, uh, giving people maybe, you know, AI processed uh, <laughs> uh, background information so people can make more informed decisions. I mean, I think these are where sort of the on-chain innovations uh, really come. So we are not peaked. We haven't even scratched the surface here yet, I, 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 I would say. Um, so uh, not everyone cares about governance right now because we're still very early, right? People are still figuring so many things out, UI, UX, you know, people scamming other people, you know, whatever, right? Um, so so uh, governance might not be on the top of mind, but I think eventually it'll be a very, very dominant use case. I'm, I'm still holding out hope that one of these days we're gonna, you know, conduct US elections over, 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 over blockchain with all these great technical features and value propositions that are only available over decentralized networks. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're only we're only getting started, only scratching the surface. We shouldn't attribute the failures of on-chain governance to on-chain. They're just typically failures of human nature in general, right? So <laughs> thank you for that, Tarox. I always love your input. You have you have great insight, by the way, sir. I, I like when you're but I loved you last week when you were here and love it now you're here this week. Uh Jin Layer, what what do you have to add to that? No, I, I totally agree with all the points that have been raised so far, especially kind of taking inspiration from real governance. You know, as Chris said, we've, we have thousands of years of examples and experience and, uh, you know, the Web3 hasn't kind of taken so much from it. And one thing in particular that kind of stands out to me is this idea that if you look at, you know, all the democracies, almost all of them in the world, they're not actually pure democracies, they're constitutional democracies. And even in organizations, right, you know, maybe a corporation is a kind of pure democracy of the shareholders, let's say token holder voting. But if you look at something like a nonprofit, again, it's not, it has some rules, it has a constitution, it can, it's actually not free to be doing almost anything. And I think in crypto, it's basically been impossible so far uh, to do something like that. Because in reality, when you look at the DAO, I mean, yeah, you pull back the mask, it's a Discord server and a multisig, you know, the vast majority of the time. Sometimes they have some extra layer, maybe using like, you know, Claros to kind of step in. But re in the reality is that in a vast majority of cases, there's really nothing to stop the majority holders, token holders in the DAO to decide to kind of, hey, let's pass a proposal and send all the, you know, treasury to ourselves. Really, you know, at the ledger level, the smart contract doesn't understand anything that's kind of happening in the DAO, except who has how many tokens and that, that gives them the control over the assets of the DAO. Um, so something we're particularly excited about, I'm particularly excited about, is this idea of constitutional DAOs. Well, what if you can actually take the constitution of the DAO and say that, hey, we're a DAO, we only invest in, you know, privacy technology or green technology or like, uh, you know, um, uh, and anything like that, kind of have a purpose for the DAO and then have this purpose be actually enforced at the ledger level, at the blockchain level, so that, you know, no matter if the, all the token holders decide to kind of cash out and wind it down, they, they cannot do it. You've set up this entity that's actually kind of trustless and unstoppable and it has a purpose that's defined in its constitution. Uh, and, you know, that would kind of match, I think, with what most democracies in the world end up doing, having a constitution. You don't let the majority token holders just vote you know, whatever they want. Uh, so that, I think that that's something that's very interesting to me. Uh, we, we're not at a peak yet. No way, no. Uh, <laughs> there's there's still so much to try and discover and uh, play around with. Thank you. And yes, I have to agree, Jin Layer. Uh, Chris, what do you got to add to that? Um, one thing I just want to add is that, uh, I forget who was, uh, mentioned this, but uh, one of you brought up the, the problem with the whale voting. And I want to kind of tap into that. and necessarily i think what we need to re realize is that an own a ownership of the actual network and having so much that you get to actually decide isn't the actual problem what the problem is is fixing how those people got that whale position because if they are truly a whale and if it's actually based on the amount of effort and 
uh, value they're adding to the network, they probably should have that much votes. The biggest issue is that these people that so far that have actually received or, you know, are, are you know, quote unquote whales, and they've been voting, they di didn't receive them based off the effort put in. And so rather than actually try to figure out a whole new way to do any type of voting, um, I, I believe that the best part to do is to make sure that the tokens distributed were actually distributed fairly to the people that are there, you know, putting in the blood, sweat, and tears on how to make the community work. And then uh, usually what happens is there's nobody putting out that much more value than everybody else. So there is actually no whales. So it's more of a distribution problem than a DAO problem or a voting problem, I would, I would think. That's super interesting, Chris. I love that. Like, uh, fix the economic model, fix the distribution model. A lot of the governance kinks will work themselves out. So there's there's a root problem that needs to be fixed instead of just there's so much experimentation we're doing on the governance side, but it could probably be fixed by focusing on something that we don't even think is directly correlated to governance. Huh. I love that. Great point, dude. It's, it's it goes back to the whole uh, you know ask the five whys like. You know, get down to the root problem rather than trying to fix the actual surface issues. Um, not saying that surface issues are not wrong. It's just that when you fix a problem that's further down, you end up usually fixing more more problems. Well, Chris, I feel like you always like to read my mind of what my next question is going to be. So, next question is: with uh, solving a distribution problem, like most of you, like Tarata and Chris and everyone else, have pretty much mentioned. How do you are sure that these tokens are going to the right people that care? You know, because in the end, like like Terex had said earlier, a lot of people here are just to make money and leave. But how do you be sure or ensuring the power is going to the right place to the right people that care? And how do you handle this properly? We'll start off with Chris and then we'll go over to Terexa. Obviously, this is something I care about tremendously. <laughs> I wake up and think about this uh, pretty much all day long. And I believe one of the actual root issues with distribution is that the large majority of the tokens that exist today were given away to investors as the first step. Um, what this means is a token was created out of thin air and money was received for that. Money, you know, they're, that's, uh, they receive that money through effort. A lot of times not through effort into the, um, the chain itself, but somewhere else, and you know they were able to afford it. But the uh, a great way to actually fix the distribution problem is to distribute the majority of the tokens through effort, not invest investment, as the starting point. Because at that point, when investors do come in, they are at least buying from the efforts of the people that put into the actual the network itself. And then what you're doing is that you're 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 not maybe it's not a silver bullet but you're at least helping the situation from the base level. Interesting. Uh, Taroxa, what do you got to add to that? Yeah, so this is very interesting. I mean, we we, we had, um, I think when we were building the uh, social AI platform Echo back in 2020, 2021, I think that's when DAOs were just getting really started in earnest. And there were a lot of DAOs and all, basically almost all of them imploded um, because of this very, very, very specific problem is that the people who bought into it didn't do anything. And the people that did, did a lot of stuff didn't have any stake. Um, so yeah, um, we one of the applications we built was this uh, application called Hype. Um, it's actually live right now at gethype.app. Um, so what it does is that it actually does airdrops in a very, very different way. Well, it, um, it, it finds, you set up a social campaign. This is specifically built for social campaigns. You set up a social campaign. You talk about exactly what you want the community members to kind of talk about, right? Um, and hype up in their own group, in other groups, doesn't matter. It's plugging to over 20,000 Telegram groups. So, um, and it, uh, it filters out spam and spammers, and then it finds these people and see how much of an impact they're making. It makes an estimation. Um, and it calculates how much rewards they should get. And when they associate, for example, their Telegram account with their, um, you know, with their wallet, they get that, you know, amount. So this is this is one way. I mean, I'm sure there's like a hundred other ways, um, but this is one way where you can actually measure contribution um, and quantify it, have it all recorded on chain. And be like, this guy got this much because he did this on this day. You can actually go back and look at exactly what he did. 
Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult to create that kind of mechanism for all forms of contribution, I would say. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a way to kind of get things started. And um, um, what this doesn't solve, though, is kind of the funding problem, right? I think a lot of projects, the reason, obviously, you know, besides just purely running a scam, which is a pretty big reason why people do this, but um, people need some startup capital, right? That's why they run these sales. Um, so it's still a little bit of a tricky problem. Like, well, how do you get capital? if all you're doing is doing this kind of like effort-based distribution. <laughs> so maybe there needs to be like, you know, two, like, you know, there, there are examples, again, you know, this is what Chris said, there are examples already in the real world, right? I mean, there are like kind of different class of voting shares, right? Uh, you know, there's the voting shares you give to the money guys who provide money and really nothing else. And then there's a second class of voting shares, which are heavily weighted um, because they're the ones who actually contribute. They're earned through blood and sweat. So maybe the blood and sweat ones just has higher voting power, you know, uh, versus the ones that were people bought in. And uh, you see this in a lot of Silicon Valley startups. They have, you know, class A, class B, class whatever, different shares have different differentiated voting power um, because they were acquired differently and the people holding them play a different role uh, in the uh, running and operating of these enterprises. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, I think there are a lot of things you can do to really rationalize um, the way that uh, the economics as well as governance is, and, and as well as how governance is tied to these economics. Thank you for that. What do you got, Chris? Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, I, I love, if there was a way to codify effort on chain, that would be the huge win. But the, in my experience, is the more that you actually codify things and actually make things more rules, more, more like, you know, ways to actually to earn, it becomes more gameable. And there needs to, it's, I think we're far away from the point of being able to actually truly codify um, effort on chain, reward on chain, because as soon as people figure out those rules, they will break those rules. And it's a cat and mouse game at that point. Um, I believe that's why there's actually needs to be a human element into it, um, even though that is less efficient. Um, it's a it's a focus on actually making that more efficient rather than going all the way 100% no humans involved until we get to the point until you know you guys make ai so good that we can't trick it anymore but we're not there yet um so that's one thing i just want to kind of add and the other thing i wanted to kind of um point at uh I'll poke at a little bit is uh, the idea of two different versions of voting um the necessity of two different uh, versions of voting means that the that the initial shares that were given out to the people of money were given out um, unfairly. And the reason why I mean that is that if for some re if, if you're able to give out shares or tokens um, in equal amount value and sweat equity, then you wouldn't need uh, different voting shares because the amount of money that was put in is the exact same amount of effort that was actually put in and then the people the people both those people would have the the same voting ability the the need for is when you start by getting in uh, investment for nothing and then you have no baseline to actually determine what the actual value was that they actually bought in compared to the extra effort so like there has to be some way which you know we, we, we're, we're figuring out but i'm not going to show it at all is that people need to make sure that generating tokens out of thin air and then selling those uh, tokens out of thin air, you set a baseline burst out that value. And then what you have to do is then you have to understand that all of the tokens that you give out after has to be based on that value that you actually gave out in the first place. Um, then you don't need two different token shares. You just end up giving away way more tokens to the people that actually put effort in, and then you then your early investors get pissed off at you. So that's why I believe giving tokens to the actual uh, the people that put in effort first sets a better baseline. Well said, sir. This is why you're my boss, Creon. What, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, uh, I, I like what Chris said there, you know, uh, giving the power to those who are actually working and to those who stand by the ethos of a project. Uh, I think they need to be incentivized. You know, if we can like distribute the power like uh, incremental uh, in an incremental way, um, 
like level by level, not not giving it away like uh, one time or something like that. Uh, I think if we do it incrementally, there's going to be like a challenge for them, and also they they have to prove themselves long term, you know, longer ter- term than 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 how than what we have right now. Um, so at least that gives us like a, uh, like an assurance that these people are gonna. Uh, work well, uh, continue the project, and also stand by the ethos of whatever it is that they're standing by, um, and um, that gives an equal opportunity uh, for those who are really working hard and and doing good in the Web three community or yeah, the majority of blockchain technology. Because if it's just based off the speculative side or or whoever holds majority of token, then that is, there's so much manipulation that's going to happen there, um, which we have seen in the past three years or probably past decade, right? So, yeah, I agree with what um, Chris said there. And uh, yeah, just adding up the, the, the like, um, was that giving the power, like, incrementally. Yeah. Thanks. No problem, sir. And I have to admit, Love the lo-fi music in the background, sir. It's definitely soothing while you're talking. Uh, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. Uh, but to move over to my last question of the day is what type of, like, you know, governance works the best? So, like, naturally, we've kind of come to decide that pure decentralized governments doesn't fully work. you got to have some reputation or some kind of, like, model put into it so you can prove that you essentially you're here for the long run if someone was going to start a DAO today what advice would you give them and how would you tell them to structure it moving forward well uh i'll take this one because i didn't really chime in on the last one but um i think uh the best advice I could give is is tuning into things like this, <laughs> just because personally I've uh, I've learned a lot today. So um, thanks, guys. I'm uh, you know I, I thought this conversation was going to go elsewhere outside of governance as well. Like did Web three peak at governance, and I'm really glad I'm I'm a part of it because uh, you know there's there's so much like deep knowledge about governance itself that got shared, and so I think um, you know I've I've personally learned a lot, um, but I think you know like. The, the the main thing that I've that I've learned today is um, that you can have all of the reputation based systems, all of the you know on chain and off chain engagement metrics codified into you know your governance you know elaborate governance systems, but if the distribution is not sound from the beginning, then you're continuing trying. It is like it's like there's a developer problem too, right? Like and you know if you if you create a faulty product. And, and then you're trying to fix the things as you go along there, you're going to break another thing as you try to fix things. So it's like, you got to build like a solid foundation before um, you can, uh, you know, really achieve a, a perfect uh, model. Um, and I think that not um, solving this distribution problem from the onset uh, with, and I'm really, really, really curious how you guys are doing this, uh, Chris and 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 at, at Voy, um, because you're like, I, 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 we know what we're doing, but we're not going to share too much. I'm like, damn, I want like, what is that? Like, how are you, how are you ensuring that the 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 protocol can get enough uh, like investment while also not ma- while also making sure that those people are not. Um, you know, uh, the, the whales that shouldn't be whales. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd love to, to pick your brain as soon as more of this information is made public, uh, because this is, this is a very cool, um, uh, oh, thing that you guys are clear. doing. So. The information is public. I'm just being nice to all of the uh, people out here. I don't want to make this Got a boy. <laughs> I'm okay, then I'm I, gonna have to dive in more. <laughs> everyone, everyone here knows I'll gladly talk for hours on end about how, how we're fixing this stuff. So, you know, catch it, okay. me on a, uh, another space. I'll be happy let's to connect. Let's connect. I'll shoot you a DM. I'd love to to see how we can uh, collab, maybe even too. You know, sounds great. Cool, but yeah, that's uh, that's all I wanted to say, guys. So thanks again. Uh, this was super fun spaces. I, I really enjoyed this.
Not a problem, Dick. Uh, Jen, what do you have to add to that, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will echo the sentiment that this has been a really great conversation in terms of, you know, you know, a lot of interesting thoughts on how to think about this. From my point of view, I think, well, it's always, you know, it's almost funny. The funny thing you can say is that it depends, but I think it really does. You know, it really depends on what the governance is for. You know, is, is, it, is this DAO to make as much money as possible? Or is it, you know, to incentivize some ecosystem or so, you kind know, of support some more um, benevolent abstract goal, you know, support some privacy projects? I think that's going to, you know, hugely affect how you even think about the governance. But I think across all those things, one of the commonalities that's come out of this conversation is that it's really kind of a UX problem and you have to take into account that people are lazy. And I think especially in crypto, because here we're kind of mixing two things, right? When I'm using a Web2 product, product Let's say I'm, a, I'm either a user, you know, I'm not expected really to participate in its governance or, you know, I'm an investor and then that's probably my job. I'm a professional investor and then, you know, there's some reasonable expectation that I will be active, an active participant, you know, and I, I expect that. Whereas in crypto, you kind of, for, I think for a good reason, and it's very interesting, but you mix those two things, your users or your token holders or your you know, um, governance participants, and it's, it's all kind of together, but that kind of raises the bar for the UX requirement. I think what's clear is that, let's call it this direct democracy is just not working. It's too much burden on all the participants. So it has a lot of issues, I think. I think the solution you have to think about in general is how do you take kind of either it's through kind of representative democracy or bringing in some AI or, you know, just adding layers, optimizing the process, improving the UX to the point where people feel like they are represented. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the involvement level is such that they can actually keep up with it and, and they're engaged. And, you know, you got to make it fun, make it exciting. It is really optional. It's not like, you know, in the real world, you live a country. So it really matters what the governance is there here. In crypto, you're kind of choosing freely to participate in a project. So again, the bar is much higher to kind of keep somebody engaged. So as a product guy, I think, yeah, it's, it's almost like a product question. How do you make the experience fun and, you know, interesting and, and not such a huge burden that people actually participate? And uh, we've discussed a lot of mechanisms here, but that's probably the key broad takeaway that you got to apply depending on your exact uh, situation. Very well said. Uh, Taraxa, what do you got to add to that, sir? Yeah, so um, obviously we don't have a uh, governance soft. <laughs> so um, I think uh, try to uh, consolidate some of the conversations here um, and distill some insights here. I think one of the lessons that I took away from all these discussions is that governance is something that is should be effort and contribution based and that uh, um, People, I think, when they're setting up a DAO or setting up a governance structure, shouldn't be too concerned about who occupies those roles because I think that's going to be an evolving. Um, it's 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 going to be an organic and evolving process, right? So, uh, who puts in the most effort, um, you know, then they occupy, you know, this, their specified roles. Uh, maybe their effort falls off after a while. Maybe those roles don't make sense for them anymore. I mean, just like we have kind of a rotating door of you know different politicians getting voted into different positions um i think uh you know these uh these these roles they get um they get rotated right amongst the community depending on their level of interest their confidence and level of contribution that's determined by whatever community so i i, I wouldn't get too worried about too bogged down by who's sitting where um but rather set up a process that allows for the natural evolution um, you know, onboarding and offboarding of uh, different people, depending on a set of clearly defined metrics. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of an evolving thing. Yeah, don't be too bogged down by, you know, John sitting in this seat or Bob is sitting in this other seat. So like, well, what kind of a person should be sitting in this seat and how do we set up the mechanism to make sure that they're onboarded and gracefully offboarded should the situation arise, yeah. Very well said. I think now is where we're going to have to end the space. We're running out of time. But just as one more final thing, I would like to give all of our guests one more opportunity to give some closing remarks. And also, I'd like to say one more time, make sure you guys follow all of our speakers up here. This was a wonderful conversation. High insight from everyone. So make sure you drop everyone a follow. You know, let's we got to help everyone here. We're all fighting the good battle against Gary Gensler and the rest of the U.S. government. So let's do it together, guys. Make sure you guys follow each other. And I'd like to start off with uh, Taraxa, and then we'll move our way down. Um, would you have any final remarks for us today, sir? 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel. I, I've learned a lot. I love your panels. Would love to uh, participate in <laughs> your future panels as well. So thank you very much for having me here again. Um, yeah, I mean, Teraxa, we're, you know, we're, we've been building for over seven years. We deploy our layer one um, very, uh, very efficient, very cost effective, very performant layer one last year. And uh, we have this uh, social AI platform that we're talking to a lot of partners, uh, building a lot of partnerships on. So, um, yeah, please uh, come and check us out. Thank you. No problem. Jim Layer, any final remarks for us today? I also want to say thank, thanks for having me. I think this is a really important conversation that we're having here. I think it's probably the most fundamental conversation in, in, in all of crypto because, you know, all the problems of any given project in the end boil down uh, more, more likely than not to governance. And even beyond, you know, if we manage to solve some of these problems here, you know, at a minimum, people are looking at building network stage, charter cities, all kinds of experiments. So they're kind of implementing these ideas, you know, and they're starting to have real effect <laughs> on the real world. And then, you know, if we do a really good job, you know, who knows, maybe we ha even have a shot at kind of improving, you know, the traditional governments of, of more traditional countries. So that's that's probably the biggest goal of all. So, yeah, thanks for hosting this really uh, cool conversation. It's been very interesting. Thank you. No, thank you, Jin Layer. Creon, any final remarks for you today, sir? Well, sir, I'd say that this is this has been a great conversation. We started from you started from presenting a question or, or a topic, and then we have a problem, and then we transition to to thinking or like brainstorming potential solutions. I love that kind of format, and uh, I am so honored to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, and I'm uh, glad to be here. Uh, thank you so much for letting me speak. And um, I, I just want to say that I'm actually uh, part of a web uh, of a web three event that's going to happen in uh, in December. It's going to happen in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I have blue to black uh, in the listeners. He's actually the, he's spearheading the that event. Uh, it's it's for Web three artists awards. It's going to happen in December. So I'm just uh, kind of like. Telling that's for you guys to know. Uh, so yeah, thank you for letting me speak uh, to speak. And, and yeah, glad to meet everybody here. Thank you, thank you. No, so thank you, Creon. Nick, any final remarks for you, sir? Yeah, again, thanks so much for having me. Great, great spaces. Love the format as well. Echo what Creon said. Um, I, I like the solution solution oriented approach. You know, begin with the end in mind. Like a lot of people have said here today, there's a lot of problems on the broader. A global stage that could probably be solved by more effective governance. So, hey, let us all, uh, all these builders here, figure it out for the rest of the world so it can be uh, adapted, uh, adopted uh, further on down the road on a larger scale. So, really glad to be here. Um, if anyone's interested in Ferrum Network and, and the protocol over there and what we're building at Ferrum Labs, please feel free to reach out. I would love to, to talk with you guys all if anyone. Uh, is in need of any sort of interoperability solution. We're making it possible for developers to build multi-chain dApps, so building in a single environment, deploying across all environment. We've created a layer two uh, that can essentially uh, turn all existing networks into a layer two of Bitcoin. We're rolling up transactions and sending them to the mother chain, Bitcoin. Um, so uh, there's a lot of cool stuff happening over there. So I'd love to, to get in touch with some of you guys and see how we could collab outside of the spaces too. So um, thanks again, everybody. Take care. Definitely looking forward to working with you in the future, Nick, for sure. And uh, Chris, any final remarks for you today, sir? Well, thank you so much for hosting this, Cody. It's been a great time. Uh, to everybody in the crowd, one thing I really want you to actually pull out of this is that governance is important. It's probably the most important thing when it comes to blockchain. Because when you own tokens, you are an owner. And through governance is what gives you your voice. And if your voice is not heard, that's a failure in the actual blockchain itself. So find a blockchain, find a community that's, that you do matter and you are actually a contributor to it. Um, so that's the main thing there. Shill a little bit. Voice has been a, a project that we started over two years ago, finally hitting uh, main nets. We're so excited about it. Uh, the, the, the genesis is September 12th, and uh, it hits, starts hitting the actual exchanges at the end of September. If you want to be part of the community, we welcome you with open arms. But only come if you want to put effort in. It, it only come if you actually want to be a part of it. Um, so please 
Can't wait to see all of you. Yes, come for the Web3, but stay for the community, as Chris put it. I appreciate everyone coming. We'll be back next Thursday with our next topic. And till next time, guys, stay true to yourself. And thank you all again, Voyagers. And thank you all to all of our guests. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>